Cannabis Common Sense, the show that tells the truth about marijuana and the politics behind its prohibition. Hello and welcome to another exciting edition of Cannabis Common Sense. We have a great show for you tonight. As usual, standing by in the wings is Mr. John Cornett. Hey, John. Hey, Paul. Good to see you. Hey, it's good to see you. Right next door is Casper Leach. Happy Friday! Our joint host. We have Hemp News. We'll be taking your phone calls here shortly. A couple uh, videos, including one about uh, the science of how cannabis and cannabinoids work. So stand by as we bring on our infamous dancing cannabis leaves. I feel the force. Tonight's first story is from the Southern Empire of California. California's Governor Jerry Brown's office is working on the framework for medical marijuana regulations in California in a session closing move that could end nearly two decades of court battles in the Golden State. With the California legislature scheduled to adjourn next week, Governor Jerry Brown's office is said to be emphasizing the details of a compromise measure on medicinal cannabis. The legislation could impact the push to put a recreational marijuana legalization initiative on the ballot in 2016. Governor Brown's office isn't commenting, but lawmakers and stakeholders have confirmed that his administration has stepped in to help develop a bill. Legislative leaders last week stripped the contents of several medical marijuana measures and linked them with boilerplate language, giving Brown's aides a chance to start all over. Exactly which department will oversee and enforce mar marijuana regulations in California has been a point of contention, leading some simmering tensions between the two chambers of the California legislature. So we'll see how that develops in the coming weeks. Rump in Canada in Nova Scotia, strains of cannabis sativa and cannabis indica possess relatively few significant genetic differences and are often mislabeled by breeders, according to an evaluation of marijuana taxonomy uh, published online in the journal PLOS One, that's P-L-O-S One. Investigators from the University of Manitoba, the University of British Columbia, and Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia evaluated the genetic structure of a diverse range of commonly cultivated marijuana and industrial hemp samples. The researchers reported, quote, we find a moderate correlation between the genetic structure of marijuana strains and the reported sativa and indica ancestry and show that marijuana strain names often do not reflect a meaningful genetic identity." End quote. They added, quote, This observation suggests that cannabis sativa and cannabis indica may represent distinguishable pools of genetic diversity, but that breeding has resulted in considerable admixture between the two. Our results suggest that the reported ancestry of some of the most common marijuana strains only partially captures their true ancestry. End quote. By contrast, the authors determined, quote, marijuana and hemp are significantly differentiated at a genome-wide level, demonstrating that the distinction between these populations is not limited to genes underlying THC production. This difference between marijuana and hemp plants has considerable legal implications in many countries, end quote. United States federal law makes no legal distinction between hemp and cannabis. The authors concluded, achieving a practical, accurate, and reliable classification system for cannabis, including a variety registration system for marijuana-type plants, will require significant scientific investment and a legal framework that accepts both licit and illicit forms of this plant. Such a system is essential in order to realize the enormous potential of cannabis as a multi-use crop and hemp, and as a medicinal plant, marijuana." End quote. This study, The Genetic Structure of Marijuana and Hip, appears online in PLOS One. That's P-L-O-S One. 
from Denver, Colorado, taxes on the legal production and sale of cannabis in the states of Colorado and Washington have yielded over $200 million in new revenue since going into effect in 2014. Retail sales of cannabis began in Colorado on January 1, 2014. Since then, regulators of Colorado have collected an estimated $117 million in marijuana-related revenue. An estimated $24 million of this money has been designated for public school construction funding, while another $8 million is being used to fund clinical studies of cannabis' efficacy. Washington initiated retail sales of cannabis on July 1, 2014. To date, the state has collected about $83 million in tax revenue. The retail sales of cannabis to those over the age of 21 will begin here in Oregon on October 1, 2015. Uruguay isn't just defending its own national sovereignty regarding its legalization of marijuana. The small South American country is now recommending that the rest of the world adopt its policies as an alternative to the war on drugs. The drug war creates a, quote, diversion of focus, end quote, according to Andre Robalo, president of the National Drug Board of Uruguay, making it necessary to switch to a sophisticated way of regulating cannabis rather than prohibiting it. Robala made the remarks during an international seminar on new approaches in drug policy in the 21st century. Lawmakers from Brazil, Chile, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Mexico, and Uruguay discussed a paradigm shift when it comes to the prohibition and legalization of drugs. For now, domestic growers in Uruguay, responsible for providing the substance for registered users through the Institute for the Regulation and Control of Cannabis, are the only ones who have profited from the legalization. About 3,000 growers have been licensed in Uruguay, according to officials. Ernest Samper, the Secretary General of the Union of South American Nations, said, quote, we're telling the world that the market regulation of marijuana is possible, end quote. That's the end of our hip news segment tonight. We're going to jump over to John Cornett. Hey, John. Hey, Paul. How you doing? Very well. How about yourself? Oh, good. You know, it's that time of year. It uh, is. You, brother. Uh, I have a whole variety of strains. Well, I'm happy to share those strains with a great many people. Pardon me? I'm happy to share those strains. I really do appreciate it. There's a couple of them I wish I had in this song, like Strawberry Cough uh -huh. and Lemon Pledge. All right. <laughs> This one was written before those. We like train wrecks, northern lights. We like Shrek too, sour diesel. matters that you do it right and get down to it so good so good so good we like train wreck
sour diesel Life is good Life is good Life is good for you and me So good So good So good So good So good John Cornett. Thank you, John. You're welcome. And we've smoked all of those, haven't we? Um, maybe. Yeah, I maybe. think so. I think there might have been one or two in there I haven't Groovy. tried, but that's okay. Most of them. So how are you doing, Casper? Oh, man, I'm as happy as a congressman in a room full of lobbyists. All right. I guess that's good. I mean, I'm And you? Sure. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. I'm happy to say that... Uh, we have our date for our Hempstock Festival. Really? A big party is going to happen here in Potland, Oregon? On on the waterfront at Tom <sighs> McCall Waterfront Park, coming up on October 17th and 18th. Uh, it's a little ways out there. Um, Give us a little more time. Uh, because it's at harvest season, it's going to be our Hempstock Harvest Festival. Cool. So, uh, And the mayor's going to be there? The mayor has said he would speak at our event. We haven't confirmed the details of that just yet. And he's bringing out a pound to smoke with everybody, right? No. He's no. not? No. Quarter pound? No. Oh. No. Well, we'll get we'll him see high. what happens. We'll get him that. Yeah. Hey, if you have a question or comment for us tonight, you can call us at 503-288-4442. That's 503-288-4442. And so... Uh, there's been a lot of developments on initiatives, too. I guess in Massachusetts, their attorney general's just approved an initiative to legalize marijuana for circulation. And so that's going to get out there. Something new happened in Ohio, didn't it? Yep, yep. There's kind of a monopoly bill out there. The, uh, the wording in the ballot title, what appears on the ballot, actually says it's a monopoly. It sets up uh, uh, 10 growers at 10 specific locations and they're the ones who put up 20 million dollars to fund the marijuana initiative in the state of Ohio. Now the Ohio legislatures put on a another initiative that uh, uh, is going to be voted on at the same time that says you can't have a monopoly on marijuana. So uh, it's going to be an interesting season in Ohio. I and know a lot of activists in Ohio oppose this because they don't think just 10 people should be able to dominate the marijuana industry. Some of the 10 people include uh, National Basketball Association star Oscar Robinson, a right. couple of descendants of President uh, William Henry Taft, who is cool. from Ohio. Cool. And cool. Uh, altogether, 10 of them that have ponied up. $20 million to right. put that thing on the ballot. Well, but it's brilliant. very controversial. I mean, well, a mutual friend of ours, uh, Don Wirtschafter, who's been an Ohio attorney and activist for marijuana legalization for a long time. Probably he hates it. opposes that. Yeah, yeah he yeah, probably he hates it. it. And I don't really like the, the monopoly aspect of it myself. But unlike Washington State, it will allow people to grow their own. So uh, up cool. in Washington State, you can't even grow one plant. So uh, and didn't Texas do something groovy here recently too? I'm not sure. What's what have I they thought been they doing? just made recreational and everything legal here. Over no, there. Texas really? Texas hasn't done that. Oh well, all right, my, my um, bad. And then they got something groovy happening in California. You mentioned that we earlier. Talked about that. Maybe a legislative bill will get pushed out regulating medical marijuana dispensaries. They haven't done that, which is why uh, the uh, the federal government keeps busting those dispensaries because they don't have a state license. It's kind of interesting, though. You know, California has their governor, Jerry Brown, who was the governor back in the 70s and is a governor again now. Uh, and here in Oregon, we have another Governor Brown, Governor Kate Brown. So we have two Brown governors. And uh, they have a brown state. It's all drought there in California. So I'm not sure how they're even planning to grow marijuana in that state. Oh, they, they grow a lot. I guess it's the number one cannabis growing state in the country. Well, so it would have to be mostly hydroponic at this point, I would think. I'm not sure. I think they, they have enough water to grow a few plants. I mean, they're the biggest agricultural state as well. So they pump right. water from a ground aquifer, and then they pull water out of the Colorado River, and they pull water 
in this huge uh, uh, public works project, the California Aqueduct, from Northern California down to Southern California. So yeah. they move their water around, but they have historic low levels of water. That's right. But the uh, the science behind the El Nino effect of the warming in the Pacific indicates they'll have a very wet winter. Well, it's about time they need it. I understand do. that most of the coast is up in flames, too. Well, we certainly had a lot of flames here. It was just a couple of weeks ago that we had a couple smoky days. I have never seen smoky days like that. I know. I thought Willie Portland. Nelson and Snoop Dogg were in town for a moment. And now only it smelled like wood smoke. The whole northwest was covered. There was even smoke going as far from our wood fires in California, Washington, Oregon, and British Columbia, uh, as far east as Nebraska was getting covered by some of the smoke here. But yeah, I did. The I winds thought, have shifted. I thought you got the medicine out for Willie Nelson. He was in the state, and you guys were just smoking Didn't out. smell like that, though. Oh, it smelled okay. like a, t a wood fire, for oh. sure. But uh, anyway, if uh, you have a question or comment for us tonight, it is the 4th of September. If you're watching on the 4th of September, you can call us at that number there on your screen. It's 503 288 4442. If you have a question about cannabis, hemp, medical marijuana, uh, give us a call. That's what we talk about here. So I'm very excited about the Hemp Stock Festival. You know, we had a contentious uh, hearing a couple of weeks ago, and, and uh, uh, the City Parks Department said that we had not done anything to curtail marijuana smoking at last year's Hemp Stock Festival where everyone in our community knows that we've gone way out of our way mm -hmm. for the first time ever, I might add, exactly. to curtail hemp, our cannabis use. But uh, I think the truth came out in a hearing in front of the, the city council. Now, and how's so, it going to be handled at a event in a state where recreational marijuana is now legal to participate in? Medical marijuana is legal to participate in and legal recreation. But it's not legal so. to use it in a public space. You know, up in Seattle, they have had designated smoking areas that are fenced in, have flame retardant covering across the fences on the outside. Now, uh, the Seattle Hemp Fest has offered to let us use, just this week, use their flame retardant covering for the nice. fences. And I went and met with someone in the mayor's office uh, earlier this week asking that uh, we be allowed to set up adults only mer designated marijuana smoking areas in our park and uh, if that didn't work at least they could do what they do in seattle which is wave the no smoking ban in the park now i know the person who's in charge of the parks department amanda fritz probably isn't going to approve that she was the only person on the city council who voted against us getting our permit which is insane because when they had the beer fest you have beer at the beer fest and people drinking beer Ooh, at the beer fest right that's right well, that's right well you know uh, uh when you have a chocolate fest people are eating chocolate right I've, have there been a chocolate fest oh yeah where, where oh. do they have those oh, have I you been it. there oh yeah they have there's something like a chocolate special every year in this town oh my god I heard anyway they had a maple fest in, oh it's amazing in and new so hampshire or something. it's like Vermont. having a marijuana fest and no marijuana really and yeah, mary jane couldn't make it last year yeah. we're hoping she'll be back this year absolutely we have a phone call welcome to the show caller yes hi i'm i'm rather new to this uh your show i actually I'm, I'm been familiar with it but i don't watch it that often my question my question has to do with now that it's legal uh, effective october one i believe um what when you're pulled over by the police and if they're testing you to see if you are under the influence or not how do you, how do they determine or is there a legal definition uh, for determining whether you're under the influence or not? Oh, good question. You know, they give you an impairment test, and if they think that you are impaired, they might take you to a local hospital and draw your blood, and then do the blood test and see what that says. Now, up in Washington, they have adopted a 5 nanogram per milliliter of THC in, a, in your blood. And so... Uh, that rule has not been adopted in Oregon. We considered it in drafting Measure 91, but rejected it because a lot of people can have double that and not be impaired. Uh, and uh, 
some people are impaired at seven or eight nanograms. So the five nanogram level isn't uh, scientifically valid for most people anyway. So uh, uh, it's still being determined though, but that's what they do. They give you a you know, field sobriety test uh -huh. and they videotape that and uh, then uh, they will take you in and draw your blood to get uh, a scientific reading on that. If they don't beat so, you up and kill you first, so in, right? So in Oregon, right. there really isn't a, a legal limit for the amount of THC in your blood. Uh, it's just up to the police to determine? It's up to the courts. Up to the courts. And the prosecutor. The police can arrest you if they think you're impaired and try to get the prosecutor, the district attorney's office to... Uh, prosecute you so it's really up to the prosecutor in the end then the judge will determine you know most people plead guilty in that s s setting but uh, uh, you know there there will be th more science uh, investigated and hopefully they'll establish something a little bit more valid for most people all right well thank you and thank you for your work on this issue I think uh, uh, I know you've been involved in this issue for a number of years thank you for it well, thank you. I appreciate that. And if they find a You're half welcome. ounce of marijuana and a used pipe in your glove compartment, is that just like now okay? <laughs> uh, it could be. It cool. could be. It remains to be seen. Um, we'll see how it all shakes out. We have another caller. Welcome to the show, caller. Hello. Ah, DEA. They never have anything to say. They just tie Hello? up the lines. No, they're not there. Uh -uh. That's okay, though. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the whole driving under the influence thing, it's not like alcohol. Uh, there's some studies that show that some people are safer when they're using marijuana than they aren't. So there needs to be a lot more investigation of just this subject. I mean, experienced users uh, uh, aren't affected to a great, great deal. Mm -hmm. In but, fact, there are, uh, some people, you're not, hmm? there are some people who I won't get in the car with them until they've gotten high. Because okay. they do drive better. Or slower, anyway. Right, Paul? Uh, some of them do. What are you saying? No. I don't have been. You were just driving me. I'm not and high. you were high. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. Not today, anyway. Okay. But uh, uh, it, we have a video out there. We're going to try to run here in just a second. It's about the uh, uh, various cannabinoids in the body's endocannabinoid system. Am I going to it's, put on my thinking cap? I think you better. Oh, jeepers. Is that uh, aluminum? Yes. I thought so. Uh -huh. Did you bring it? Aluminum cap. Yeah, I've got it. Let me get it out. Here's our video. We'll be back in just a moment. In the 1980s, scientists would discover the endocannabinoid system within the human body. Now this would lay waste to claims for decades. The cannabinoids had no beneficial purpose for human consumption. Obesity, particularly abdominal obesity and the associated cardiometabolic complications are critical areas of investigation. The endocannabinoid system helps to regulate the central control of energy balance and peripheral metabolic processes, both of which may contribute to cardiometabolic risk factors. The endocannabinoid system, or ECS, influences multiple physiologic processes. This intricate system modulates energy intake as well as nutrient transport, metabolism, and storage. The ECS regulates these processes through endogenous ligands, such as anandamide and 2-arachidonyl glycerol, and the CB1 receptor. CB1 receptors are located in the brain, digestive tract, muscle, and adipose tissue. Integration of these central and peripheral ECS components is achieved through neuronal and hormonal signaling.
Within the brain, CB1 receptors are among the most abundant G-protein coupled receptors. However, in contrast to classical signaling, where information travels from pre to post synaptic neurons, the ECS uses retrograde signaling. The information travels from post to presynaptic neuron. Let's take a closer look at this mechanism using a glutamatergic neuron model. When an action potential reaches the axon terminal, membrane depolarization triggers the release of glutamate. Glutamate binds to postsynaptic glutamate receptors, inducing calcium channels to open. During periods of intense neural activity, calcium accumulates in the postsynaptic neuron. This calcium buildup causes the synthesis and release of endocannabinoids from membrane lipids. Diffusing across the synaptic cleft, the endocannabinoids bind to the CB1 receptor, activating the G proteins. Activation influences ion flow. The result, suppression of presynaptic neurotransmitter release. Endocannabinoids are subsequently taken back into the cell and enzymatically degraded. In addition to acting as neural messengers, endocannabinoids mediate paracrine and autocrine signaling in adipocytes, hepatocytes, and other cells. endocannabinoid system activity in the central nervous system regulates food intake. For example, ECS stimulation by hunger and fasting signals stimulates appetite and increases the palatability of food. Endocannabinoids slow gastric emptying and GI transit and appear to stimulate secretion of ghrelin, a neuropeptide that increases appetite and food intake. After eating, Cholecystokinin in the duodenum triggers satiety signals. Subsequently, ECS activity is decreased through suppression of CB1 expression. An increase in the adiposity hormone leptin decreases endocannabinoid levels in the hypothalamus and decreases food intake. ECS regulation of peripheral metabolism influences energy balance. Stimulation of the ECS increases food intake and adiposity. Conversely, blocking CB1 receptors reduces food intake and adiposity. In the liver, ECS stimulation can lead to lipogenesis through the activation of hepatic lipogenic enzymes and increased fatty acid synthesis. Chronic stimulation of the ECS is associated with dyslipidemia. Activation of CB1 receptors increases expression of SREBP1C, a lipogenic transcription factor, and increases fatty acid synthesis. SREBP1C increases production of lipogenic enzymes, ACC1, and fatty acid synthase. Increased fatty acid synthesis can lead to production of large triglyceride-rich VLDL. Large triglyceride-rich VLDL sets the stage for the atherogenic lipid profile of small, dense LDL, decreased levels of atheroprotective HDL, and overall increases in cholesterol and triglyceride levels. Adiponectin, another hormone secreted by adipocytes, regulates lipid and glucose metabolism. Adiponectin is believed to regulate fatty acid oxidation in muscle and liver, thus improving insulin sensitivity. CB1 receptor stimulation in adipocytes reduces adiponectin, while CB1 blockade increases adiponectin synthesis. Metabolic dysregulation leads to a constellation of symptoms including abdominal obesity, atherogenic dyslipidemia, hypertension, insulin resistance, prothrombotic state, and pro-inflammatory state. As basic and clinical research progresses, we will continue to increase our understanding of the central and peripheral endocannabinoid system and its role in the regulation of metabolic function. There you have it, in one plain video. Cannabis could be mankind's symbiotic plant. Until next time, I'm William Martin with Cannabis Science.
Wow. All right. So, yeah, that's a video. The most of that video is from the University of Nebraska, and it's about four years old. So the science continues to advance. Well, the cartoons were great to watch, but I didn't understand two-thirds of the words. I understand. I went to public school, so. so. That explains it. That explains it. Uh, we have a phone call. Welcome to the show, caller. Hi, uh, Paul. Yes. Uh, I got cut off last time. But uh oh. Well, welcome uh, back. Sounding good. Before I get to my question, uh, thank you and Casper for all you've done for the cause. And You're uh, welcome. I really like your suit. It uh, matches your hair. <laughs> <laughs> and is, is it? Yeah, made my out hair of keeps hemp? getting whiter and whiter. But that's what happens if you're lucky, I guess. <laughs> is it made out of hemp? Uh, no, it's not. Yeah. You know, I just went into the, the store and bought it off the shelf. I hope to have a hemp. I had a hemp jacket a while back, but uh, uh, I don't have one that'll fit anymore. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's a cool suit. I like it. Thank you. But anyways, uh, I'm uh, growing a little plant. I haven't grown anything in about 30 years and uh -huh. getting back into the. It's experience. great that it's legal, right? Yeah, it's a penny wise and it's looking real good. The only thing is, is uh, I found some yellow leaves on it. Where are those yellow leaves at? Uh, they were kind of on one stem. Uh huh. There was about uh, about twenty of them. So are they at the bottom of the plant, well, underneath uh, the green leaves, at the top uh, of the plant? They were, some were on the bottom, and some were about midway. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, mainly at the bottom. Now, there is a set of nutrients that are mobile nutrients. Nitrogen is one of them. So uh, nitrogen deficiencies generally show up at the bottom or near the middle of the plant. What's happening is the plant is pulling nitrogen from those leaves and using it for the new growth up at the top and the bud formation. You might you don't want to give them a lot of nitrogen during the budding cycle, but you might want to supplement with just a little bit, and uh, uh, you want to concentrate during the budding cycle on potassium and phosphorus, or the P and K in the NPK main mix. And uh, it's always good to supplement with uh, uh, kelp, which has a lot of micronutrients. Oh, I never thought of that. There's uh, uh, the, the immobile nutrients tend to show up at the top of the plant because they can't pull the nutrients from the bottom of the plant. So if your, uh, your leaf problem discoloration is happening at the bottom, you know it's most likely a mobile nutrient deficiency where it's if, at the, if it's at the top, it's an immobile nutrient deficiency. Well, it's budding out real good. Good. Well, good. what's probably happening is the uh, the plant's pulling those nutrients out of those leaves. It doesn't really need them anymore and making your buds. Yeah. <clears throat> Can you smoke those yellow leaves? I don't recommend it. In fact, I recommend you leave them on the plant until they turn brown and, and crispy. That way the plant can continue to pull those nutrients out and then just compost them because they oh. uh, they won't be any good for anything. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I, I picked I, I was I picked about 15 to 20 of them off the plant. Did so you try I, to smoke them? No. Uh -uh. Yeah, it probably but won't work very well. I'll try it, you know, what I got to lose. If you're desperate, you know, you don't have anything <laughs> else, maybe. <laughs> Not that desperate. Good. good. But uh, anyways, you guys, uh, thanks for answering my question, and uh, got a great show. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, talk to you have later. Bye. Maybe we should rename the bottom leaves Congressional Leaves because they're only fit for neutral, for fertilizer. There's an idea for sure. Not that I have any negative feelings towards Congress. Well, we like our congressman, Earl Blumenauer. He's definitely been... That's why yeah, I wear you've this. You've got your, your bow tie, your Earl That's Blumenauer right. bow tie, bow Earl, tie of the week. It, is, oh, I thought it was Blumen trousers. Well, whatever. Okay. Anyway, That's why I wear this as an honor to... Uh, he just did a series of fundraisers at Marijuana Gardens nice. uh, down in Southern Oregon and did a big fundraiser a couple nights ago with uh, a, women, a women's marijuana growing group. Uh, does he smoke out with you and Willie no, and Snoop no. Dogg? He just smokes at home, huh? 
I don't know. I don't oh. know about his smoking habits. I've never inquired that. I don't usually. Oh well, inquire. we should have him on the show and ask him sometime. Maybe so. That'd Maybe so. Cool. We had him come and speak at the uh, the marijuana march in May of last year, uh -huh. and that was a good thing. But he's been the most vocal member of Congress since the retirement of Barney Frank a couple of years ago. Right. So it's good to see him uh, representing us. I mean. In, in 2012, we got 62% uh, of the vote in Portland for marijuana sure. legalization on Measure 80. And in 2014, we got 72% of the vote here in Portland for marijuana legalization. So he knows he's backed by his sure. constituency. But Blumenauer also was a state representative back in 1973 and voted to decriminalize marijuana and made Oregon the first state to decriminalize marijuana and if way you back read, when. If you read Barney Frank's book, he'll tell you that the only reason why he came out of the closet was because he needed the space to grow his plant. There you have it. There you have it. Uh, if you have a call or a question for us tonight, you can call us there at 503-288-4442. That's 503-288-4442. If you or a loved one are looking for a doctor who can help you get a medical marijuana permit, whether it be in Oregon, Washington, California, Hawaii, or places back east, you can call us at that number there on your screen. It's 1-800-723-0188. It's 1-800-723-0188. If you're here in the Portland area, you can call us locally at 503-281-5100. That's 503-281-5100. We do have our Hemp Stock Festival coming up. If you're interested in being a vendor or sponsor at the Portland Hipstock Festival, you want to call us at this number, 503-235-4606. That's 503-235-4606. And you can check in at Hempstock, that's H-E-M-P-S-T-A-L-K, at uh, .org, H-E-M-P-S-T-A-L-K, at, at .org. And so... Uh, you can see there's our, our poster. Uh, we've had several folks that we've lost this year, but one of them is Larry Kirk, and so we've changed the color of the L and the K to uh, represent uh, LK. That was his nickname. And our little uh, hempstock bird has, is wearing the bowler hat that LK often wore in public, you know. So uh, uh, this one's dedicated to him and our own sister Sativa, Ray Crystal. Rod, uh, who has helped us, uh, you know, produce this show for many, many years. So uh, uh, we've lost a few of our compatriots this year, but uh, the beat goes on. Sure. And during the uh, Hempstock weekend, I can I volunteer in my apartment as a designated smoking area. We can. It's not close, but. Anybody got some good herb they want to smoke out before? I can post my phone number and address on the internet if you want. I think mm. you do that, don't you? On Craigslist, but this time it would be like on the marijuana website. Instead. Oh, I see. Yeah. I see a little different. All little right. Different. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. Well, we have our hemp flame of freedom here. This is 100% hemp oil and with a hemp wick. And this is the reason marijuana is illegal. It's because the, uh, the forces of evil, uh, who our friend Gatewood Galbraith called the petrochemical, pharmaceutical, military, industrial, transnational, corporate, elite, fascist, sons of a bitches. There you go. They uh, gave us marijuana prohibition so they could sell us petroleum. And when we can grow hemp again without regard to its THC content, but with regard to its most productive seed, fiber and biomass factors then we will see a replacement of a lot of uh, petroleum and that is one of our goals and until we can do that until everybody can grow their own and not worry about uh, being arrested then uh, our, the work continues in terms of cannabis reform. It seems to me that mankind went stupid when it fell in love with petroleum from mm -hmm. that point, from the moment mankind said, oh, I love petroleum, we've ruined the earth, we've screwed up our future, we've screwed up our economy, we've screwed up the environment, we've depleted all of our, all of our energy resources, it seems like any, it's just like horrible what we've done. 
and yet here is the most easy solution to all of that stupidity and yet these greedy people refuse to embrace it is that not nuts i think it's nuts i think there's no doubt about that you know i just want to tell you that if you are a medical marijuana patient and you've received a letter like this about your residency uh, you really uh, don't have to worry about it right now. Uh, there's a residency requirement that uh, goes into effect here pretty soon. They're sending this out to many different uh, medical marijuana patients. If you've received it, uh, don't worry. Just read it. Take that knowledge. Some of it talks about pesticide and pesticide advisory on the reverse of the letter. The other one talks about the new grower residency requirements. And so uh, as of July 1st, uh, marijuana growers have to certify that they've been a resident of the state for the past two years. And for most of us, it means having an Oregon ID card that's issued over two years ago. So that's uh, something we want to tell you about because we're getting a lot of calls about that. I know a lot of people are concerned. If you've renewed your medical marijuana permit since July 1st, you might get a letter like that in the mail. If your ID is more than two years old, you don't have to worry about anything else. and They will notify you if there's a problem. Okay, we have another caller. Welcome to the show, caller. Well, hey, guys. Hey. It's Casper. I met you at 7-Eleven the other day. Oh, hey. Happy Friday. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say, uh, I wanted to mention that one plant I was talking about, the hermaphrodite on me. That big plant? Well, well, yeah, it wasn't real big, but yeah, uh, Paul, you might know about this too. It, it, it is a uh, Jacques Horror. It was a Nirvana seed take on Jack Herer plant, uh, but it went hermaphrodite. It's a lot of different things, so it's not genetically stable. Uh, did you grow it from a seed? Yes. I see. Okay. And, and but I, anyway, I have two of them. I, when it was real small, I topped it and cloned the top. And it was the top went hermaphrodite. The, the bottom of it is just this huge, beautiful bush. And uh, you, Cassie, you saw a picture of that the other day. Uh huh. Uh, but I'm, it's just it's weird. I've got like eight branches went male, and, and there's I got four or five that are still female. Is that like common or? Well, I recommend you cut the hermaphrodite or any of your males and let your females continue to flower. If yeah, you want to put it back over doing. before you cut them down so you don't send out too much pollen to yeah, your surrounding females, that, that, that would be wise. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you for hey, watching. We appreciate it. You're welcome. So, Casper, you got a radio network. I know you were just saying that you've got a new show that's starting soon. You want yeah, to tell our audience about that? Yeah, we got a new show that's going to be broadcasting on the Time for Ham Global Broadcasting Network. Some of you may have heard of Cannabis Culture, and uh, the gentleman who is the founder of that, Mark Emery, he will be hosting a weekly broadcast on the Time for Him Global Broadcasting Network. It will debut at high noon Eastern Standard Time. That's 9 a.m. Pacific Standard, and it will be every week, every Wednesday, so make it a point to tune in and enjoy that. He'll be bringing Jody to the uh, program as well, and many of his friends, so... And uh, we're about ready to launch into the Roku TV network in another couple of weeks. So finally, we're going to have that off the ground. We're now in iTunes. And, of course, we've been in iHeartRadio for a couple of years. And uh, so we're pretty excited about all the things that are growing at the Time for Him Global Broadcasting Network. We ask that you listen just an hour a day for a month. And every other hour is music. Every other hour is talk. And we figure at the end of a month, you should fall in love with all of the hosts on our network that you'll want to listen to us every day. So, so Mark Emery was in U.S. federal prison for yeah. four and a half years. Yeah. He was extradited from Vancouver, Canada. Right. They released him about 13 months ago. And so... Uh, he said he had a lot of fun in there. He played guitar and wrote his friends and read books. It was like a... You know, like a vacation, you know. I don't think it was quite like a vacation. Well, well. But, uh, he made the best of it. <laughs> he made no the doubt. best of it. All right, fine. It's about the, the best you can well. do, I guess. All right. And so, yeah, and so he's pretty well known, too. He's got a lot of people who appreciate his hard work, such as myself and Paul. And we also admire his lovely wife, Jody, who's 
been politically active and has worked diligently to help make cannabis culture a success as well. And they are just a brilliant team and they're going to be bringing their expertise about cannabis and all their interesting stories to the Time for Hemp Global Broadcasting Network every Wednesday at high noon Eastern Standard Time. We did a series of five shows at his store back in 1999 when he first uh, moved to Vancouver. I guess he moved there about 97, 96. Right. He's originally from uh, London, Ontario, and he had a uh, bookstore there that uh, was famous for uh, importing and selling High Times magazine, which was then illegal in Canada. So he pushed the envelope there and then decided he'd move out to B.C., back uh, in the mid-90s and has been there ever since. Sold uh, marijuana seeds and the federal government decided he was uh, public enemy number one and uh, went after him with a vengeance. And he fought extradition for a while, but in the end he took a plea bargain so they wouldn't continue to prosecute his uh, other employees and he just came to the United States and, and served uh, four and a half years. Seems like a lot of hosts of my network have been public enemy number one at one time or another. And are some of our guests, like Dr. Levesque here in the state, was the most wanted man in America. And most dangerous. Most dangerous man That's in the state. That's uh, what the medical board said. And, and we all know what your reputation has done here in the state. They just, you're notorious. I'm sure they wanted <laughs> to put you away. And me, oh my God, the DEA is always climbing up my backyard looking in if they can. I so we got a lot of people on our network who just seem to have this really friendly relationship with law enforcement. But uh, do tune in. If you have a question or comment for us tonight, you can call us at 503-288-4442. That's 503-288-4442. We got about 12, 12 and a half minutes to go. And we do have a caller standing by. Welcome to the show, caller. Hi, I have uh, two questions. I am okay. concerned about pesticides. Um, I'm primarily cook with marijuana, but um, I would like to grow some plants of my own. And I'd like to know where to get some seeds. Can you say that one more time? I would like to know where you buy seeds. Oh, there's no place to legally buy seeds right now. There have been a few people who've given them away. Uh, come October 1st, you'll be able to buy seeds from the uh, marijuana dispensaries out there. And uh, you can also order them online for mail delivery. Again, that's not entirely legal, but 99% of them get through. So uh, that's all we can do right now. You, there is no legal place to buy seeds for another uh, four weeks here until October 1st. And if you were going to buy seeds, what kind of seeds would you buy? Autoflowering? Uh, I don't really like autoflowering varieties myself. No. Uh, uh, it depends on what you like. Uh, well, I cook with it. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I, I want to grow plants that I can cook with. So uh, what, what would be something that you might recommend? Oh, gee, you know, uh, I particularly like lemon varieties. Uh, strong indica varieties uh, are, tend to make you sleepy, where indica, where sativa varieties tend to, to wake you up more. Uh, but the same strain can affect different people differently, and the same strain can be radically different if you harvest it uh, six weeks into the flower cycle, eight, 10, 12 weeks, the cannabinoid profile continues to change. And so uh, it's difficult for me to recommend something specifically uh, at this time. Well, let me ask you this. Is there one that's close to a weed? Because uh, that would what? be... A a plant that is very that grows in the wild, a marijuana plant that grows in the wild very easily. Most of them will grow very easily because they are all uh, cannabis. There's a reason they call it weed because it can just go out of control. It can grow faster than any other plant. And so uh, uh, I can just say trial and error. I can't really recommend any specifically. What I like to do is grow from clones because then I know I have uh, a, a proven variety. Uh, so uh, once clones are available, I recommend you grow from clones unless you want to make seeds and then you can grow males and females and, and make seeds. But if you don't want to do that, 
uh, come October 1st, you should probably buy a, a female clone of a proven variety. And then you can actually try that variety and then decide to buy the cutting or, or vice versa. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Thank you. We have another caller. Welcome to the show, caller. Hey. Hey. You got a question for us? There is a six-second delay. Oh, well. Hey, you know, come Monday night, I'm going to be at Fight Church TV, which You're is... You're going to have a fight with the church on TV. It, no, it's a program that Jesse Sponberg uh, produces, uh, and uh, I'll be over there. I understand that the first hundred people who show up get a marijuana treat. Oh. They get they get some free marijuana. Groovy. That's something that that Jesse is doing. It's at a theater at the 1400 block of Caesar Chavez Boulevard, nice. which used to be 39th Avenue. Nice. But now it's uh Caesar Chavez, the 1400 block. It's uh, uh a pub that starts with A. Does anybody in here know the name of that pub? Analog Pub. That's it. Analog Pub. So I think it's at about 7.30 come this coming Monday, September 7th. So uh, nice. we'll see you there. So that's the, at the end of our three-day weekend. It is. It is. It'll be a, be a party. So there'll probably be lots of marijuana He said they were getting 500 people. There's Good several other golly. guests. There's a comedian. There's music. Wow. I haven't been there before, but I hear it's... Uh, Really grown into something big over the fat past few months. Nice. We have another caller, though. Welcome to the show, caller. How you doing, Paul? Pretty well. How are you? Not bad. Um, are we going to have, the for the festival, are we going on the north side of the Hawthorne Bridge? Uh, no. It's going to be in the same place as last year, in the same bowl that uh, uh, the... Portland Blues Festival is in. I wanted to go to the flat part of the park. I requested that, but they said they've done something to winterize the ga the grass and that we couldn't use that. So uh, they've given us the same section, uh, and we'll have to see how that shakes out for uh, future use. But uh, uh, it will be right there at the uh, west end of the Hawthorne Bridge. Okay. Thank you very much, and I appreciate everything you guys do. Hey, you're very welcome. Thank you. Well, we're down to just about six minutes left to go here. Casper, you want to give another shameless plug for your radio network? Do want to remind people that we are 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the only all-cannabis, all-the-time broadcasting network on iHeartRadio. And we have a team of about 10, 15 people that are broadcasting original content about the need to end Prohibition. All of the programming that we produce is archived on the website and can be downloaded for free, shared with your friends. You can find our apps in the Google Plus Store, the iTunes Store, SoundCloud, Tumblr, and of course you can go to timeforhemp.com and find all the social outlets that we are on. And like a joint, we are always best when shared with friends. And remember, the next time you hear me, you know it's time for hemp. Thank you very much, Paul. All right, and so uh, you can find out more about the Hempstock Festival at hempstock.org. That's H-E-M-P-S-T-A-L-K dot O-R-G. We have a uh, uh, portal to all our various uh, websites at hemp.org. That's H-E-M-P dot O-R-G. And so uh, there's... Uh, uh, links there to our museum. And then we also have uh, the latest news you can find at hemp.org slash news in English. That's hemp.org slash news. Or in Spanish, it's uh, uh, noticias. Uh, hemp.org noticias. That's uh, H-E-M-P dot O-R-G slash N-O-T-I-C-I-A-S. And you can get uh, the latest news translated into Spanish. And so uh, uh, we're providing a lot of information out there. You can watch this show also on YouTube just about any day. And uh, uh, tell your friends to call in for uh, uh, our, our 
information. If you need a doctor to help you get a medical marijuana permit anywhere in the United States, call us toll free at 1-800-723-0188. That's 1-800-723-0188. Or you call us here in Portland at 503-281-5100. Or just go to hemp.org and you can find us there as well. We are just about out. I know John Cornett's over here getting mic'd and wired up, ready to play some more music. Uh, uh, you ready for about three minutes of music, John? Can you handle that? All right, good. I want to thank you guys for watching. Tune in next week and help us restore him. Good night. Howdy. You know, I started using cannabis about, by the way, it is cannabis, about eight years ago. Since then, I have learned that it's so much more than just a weed. There's a train coming. And for some there's no going back 